former Canadian World Junior hockey player and ex-member of the Ottawa Senators, turns himself into police. He's the first of five hockey players expected to be charged in connection to a 2018 sexual assault in London, Ontario. And... Another day, another night. Nothing changes. Global Affairs Canada says it's aware of a Canadian missing in Gaza. Tonight, we hear from worried friends in the GTA. Plus... They're stressed. They're sick to their stomachs. Concern and confusion after Canada announces a new two-year cap on international student study permits. This is CBC Late Night News. Hello, thanks for joining us. The first of five hockey players expected to be charged in connection to a 2018 sexual assault in London, Ontario, has now surrendered to police. Alex Formanton was once a player with the Ottawa Senators and the Canadian World Junior Hockey Team. Sarah Levitt has more on what we've learned tonight. Wearing a serious expression and flanked by lawyers, Alex Formanton, the former NHL player and member of Canada's 2018 junior hockey team, surrendered to London, Ontario Police Sunday. His lawyer, Daniel Brown, confirmed he was charged, along with other players, in connection to an accusation made in 2018. He provided no further details. Last week, the Globe and Mail reported five members of Canada's 2018 World Junior Team were told to surrender to police. The group expected to face sexual assault charges tied to allegations dating back to that year. CBC News has not independently verified the report. According to court documents, the alleged victim, known only as EM, said she was sexually assaulted by a group of players. None of the allegations have been proven in court. Bailey Reed works in sexual violence prevention and has been watching this investigation closely. It can be really hard for um, survivors to see justice and it can be hard for police to um, bring charges forward. I wish it wasn't this complicated, but the system that we currently work with for sexual violence doesn't work particularly well. In 2022, the alleged victim sued eight players, Hockey Canada and the Canadian Hockey League, for more than $3.5 million in damages. Hockey Canada settled out of court. As previously reported by CBC News, five players, including Formanton, have now been granted indefinite leaves from their teams. So far, there's no evidence connecting those leaves to the allegations. Today, Formanton's lawyer issued a statement saying Alex will vigorously defend his innocence and asks that people not rush to judgment without hearing all of the evidence. London police wouldn't comment, only saying more details will be given in a news conference February 5th. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. Toronto's mayor appears to be headed for a budget showdown with the city's police service. Olivia Chow is balancing a massive deficit and pressure to address emergency call response times. The Toronto Police Association has started a public campaign to fight for funding. There are officers on the front lines that are heartbroken that they're getting a call and it's taking them 22 minutes to get there. I have heard um, a story about a 911 operator and the heartache that she had not being able to get an officer to, re to respond to a domestic. So I think that what you're seeing in the police's advocacy really reflects the hardship they're seeing on the ground and how they want things to improve for the people of Toronto. The police service wants $20 million added to their nearly $1.2 billion budget for this year. City staff say they should get $7.4 million. The police chief says that would be a cut. Chow will have to decide if she endorses the staff proposal in her draft budget. Now, that's coming Thursday. City council will then have the final say with a budget vote on February 14th. You can head to our website to see more by our City Hall reporter, Sean Jeffords. That's at cbc.ca slash Toronto. Well, the next time you need to renew your driver's license or health card, you could be heading to Staples. You may remember late last year, the province announced plans to move some Service Ontario offices to the big box locations. As Tyler Cheese tells us, the government is expected to unveil more details first thing tomorrow morning. 
Shannon, we do have some of those details tonight. According to a report from the Canadian press, nine standalone locations will be moved, six of those as soon as this Thursday. Now, the province's plan seems to have shifted since it was first announced late last year. At that time, Minister Todd McCarthy said only new service Ontario centres would open in select staple stores, but he didn't say any existing centres would close. He said staple stores offer more parking and better hours. He also said the change would save taxpayers almost a million dollars compared to the existing private providers they're replacing. Now, critics have called out the Ontario government for cutting a deal with Staples instead of opening it up for public bidding. But the minister said it's a pilot project. They also said they're looking for new partners to open more service Ontario locations, including potentially Canadian Tire and Home Hardware. Now, we are expecting to get more information on this tomorrow morning as the minister is set to make an announcement at 8.30 in Oakville. Shannon? That's Tyler Cheese reporting from Queen's Park. Well, a long-standing health centre in Sault Ste. Marie is struggling with a doctor shortage. Some 10,000 patients are now being notified by mail that they will be losing their family doctor this spring. The group health centre was established 60 years ago when OHIP didn't exist. Over the last six years, the centre has had to cut 3,000 patients. But now it's facing the departure of even more doctors due to retirement or leaving the community. This is a significant problem across of all of Northern Ontario, across Ontario and across Canada. In Ontario, it's almost two and a half million people, two and a half million people who will not have a family doctor. And in 2026, just two years from now, that's going to be close to four and a half million people unless something happens very soon. Well, as Parliament resumes in Ottawa tomorrow, on the agenda this week is a review of controversial plans to expand medical assistance in dying to people with mental illness. Here's Olivia Stefanovic. Opposition parties are urging the federal government to hit the brakes on a planned expansion of medical assistance in dying hard. People whose sole medical condition is mental illness are set to become eligible for MAID by mid-March. The federal government asked a special joint committee on MAID last fall to study the issue, specifically how prepared Canada's health care system is for the eventual expansion. Canada isn't ready. We're certainly not ready in March of this year, and we won't be ready in the foreseeable future, if at all. And I think when you look at Canadian society, the fact that there are so many marginalized people in our country who right now are not getting adequate access to mental health services, I think this is very much an example of us uh, or the Liberal government having put the cart before the horse. The committee heard from a wide range of witnesses from medical and legal backgrounds. Conservatives say they were swayed from psychiatrists, a number who said that it's difficult to determine whether a patient who has mental illness is making a rational request for MAID and whether this patient with mental illness could not get better in the future. But some members of the Special Joint Committee on MAID don't agree with this analysis. They say Canada is in fact ready for this expansion of MAID to include mental illness. What I think we need to be led by is by compassion and we need to be led by respect. We have to respect that people are suffering. We have to respect that people can make an end of life choice and we can't discriminate. The government says it will act immediately on the committee's report. It's already delayed expanding May to mental illness once and it's not ruling out another delay. Uh, we certainly recognize that there is equivalency between uh, physical suffering and mental suffering, uh, but we need to make sure that the supports are there, um, that the training uh, is in place. The committee's report is due by Wednesday. The government doesn't have to follow what it says. It has 120 days to respond, but the government will be compelled to act sooner if it chooses to seek another delay. The government will have to introduce and pass new legislation to prevent MAID for mental illness from taking effect by mid-March. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. 
Voters in Durham will be heading to the polls in March for a federal by-election after former Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole announced he's retiring from politics. Conservatives have held the seat for the past two decades. The result of the by-election will not shift the balance of power in the House of Commons, but it could prove an important test of support in the key 905 region of our province. Sophia is here with our first look at the forecast. It was kind of feeling like spring out there today. Mm -hmm, a sign of the warmer air mass that pushed away the system that we really dodged the bullet from earlier today. It really ended up just being a little bit of wet snow from the Niagara region. Could have been a light snowmaker for many of the 905 regions around Lake Ontario. Monday morning and Monday afternoon, we are above seasonal. Again, similar pattern as we have been this past week with lacking one big ingredient. All that fog we had last week. We will be, well, cloudy for this upcoming work week. Really, the only system that looks to push in in the short range is a bit of snow for parts of southwestern Ontario for Tuesday afternoon and evening. After that, a glorious big ridge of high pressure sets up for some wonderful midweek warmth. I'll show you how far that warmth goes up towards Hudson's Bay and James Bay in the long range. But the question is, will this also bring sunshine along with the warmth? No, it's another dreary week ahead, but in the long range, I'll tell you about the clear sunny skies and cool down that could be good for your backyard rinks for next weekend. Shannon. Okay, thanks, Sophia. We'll see you shortly. Friends and loved ones are growing increasingly worried about a Canadian father missing in Gaza. Mansour Schumann, known as a citizen journalist, regularly posts videos to hundreds of thousands of followers on social media. As Anim Khan shows us, now his community is doing all they can to find him. For the last week, Zahira Sumar has been immersed in the search of Mansoor Schumann, constantly making phone calls, sending messages, hoping to find clues of her friend. A Canadian Palestinian in Gaza, she was in contact with almost daily. Monday afternoon, we started thinking something's wrong. Sumar is one of five volunteers that share Schumann's videos on social media. They include his humanitarian work and him reporting what is happening on the ground. The Calgary resident moved to Gaza with his wife and five kids last year. Two months ago, his wife and kids fled for the United Arab Emirates, but Schumann decided to stay. And he wanted to have an impact and make an impact for Palestine. And he did. His work reached far and wide, with an Instagram account amassing nearly 300,000 followers and a global reach with his storytelling. Right now, the tent I'm in has around a dozen people, half of them with injuries. But things took a turn last week. This was the last video his team received. It's January the 21st, 2024, live here from Gaza. Sumar says a few workers with the relief organizations Schumann helped saw Mansour that day when he was on his way to Khan Yunus from Rafa. They have seen IDF arresting uh, Mansour. Global Affairs Canada says due to privacy, it can't give too many details, only confirming a Canadian is missing in Gaza. In a statement saying Canadian officials continue to monitor the situation closely and are in direct contact with the family members. His social media accounts are now being used to help find him, calling on the Canadian government to help bring him home. Number one, you need to confirm with IDF if they have him. Number two, if they do, where is he? Adam Khan, CBC News, Toronto. Meantime, the UN Secretary General is demanding 11 countries, including Canada, reverse decisions to pause funding to the UN's Palestinian Relief Agency. Most in Gaza now rely on agency aid. UN officials say funding pauses might stop its work and famine could be inevitable. It follows Israeli allegations that 12 agency staff were involved in the Hamas attacks in October. A state funeral was held today in Ottawa for Ed Broadbent, the federal NDP leader from 1975 to 1989. He believed very strongly that government was a force for good, that it should protect people, it should lift up people. He believed fundamentally that we are better off when we take care of each other. Broadbent gained wide respect over more than two decades in Parliament, many remembering today his dedication to improving the lives of all Canadians. 
his integrity and compassion. After leaving politics, he still joined in NDP election campaigns and he founded the Broadbent Institute in Ottawa. That's a social democratic think tank. He is only the second opposition leader in Canadian history honored with a state funeral. There is a lot of concern, a lot of confusion among international students after those big changes were announced this week, capping the number of study permits over the next two years. Deanna Sumanak johnson has more from students and fears over rising tuition. This is not easy for them. Sadam Rao is no stranger to assisting international students in crisis, but her phone's been ringing off the hook this week. Many of our members from across the country have sent me emails and texts saying that they're stressed, they're sick to their stomachs. One part of the federal announcement to international students, their spouses won't be able to get open work permits anymore. One of the decisions that were made was to separate families of international students who are, are studying at the college and undergraduate levels. And families deserve to be together. The new federal announcement puts a cap on the number of international students Canada can accept over the next two years. It was presented as a measure to regulate the booming, sometimes exploitative practice of recruiting international students, many of whom are using their studies as a path to permanent residency. However, those high tuitions also fill the coffers of institutions. And there are fears that in the short term, at least, the measures could affect not only international students, but also domestic students and professors. I stopped dead in my tracks. I was like, you have got to be kidding me. Vicky Kwao, studying here from Ghana, fears there'll be a tuition increase for international students. The money's going to come from somewhere else. So they turn around and put that cost on students. That question, where will the money come from with fewer international students enrolled, troubles many. Cuts to the programs that normally take in a lot of foreign students are possible. So it would mean like having to move away from tenure track faculty to, to more sessionals or contract faculty, reducing hiring and, and, and uh, cutting costs in other ways. But it would also possibly mean that um, removal of some of these programs. And that would impact domestic students too. We have to face the fact the bill is being footed by international students. So a decrease in that is a decrease in funds and it's a decrease in the programs that domestic students are also in. Now we know from the federal announcement that provinces that take in the bulk of international students, specifically Ontario, are looking at a close to 50% cut, whereas other provinces may be looking at a smaller cut. What's less clear is whether the so-called diploma mills will be docked more steeply than the more reputable institutions. Even a more moderate cut could have far-reaching effects, says this president of a small public college in PEI. If we were hit with a third, um, we've got about 30% of our student population now is international, so if we had to drop that to 20, um, that we'd see an immediate impact on our bottom line, I, I think, um, and most importantly, we might see an impact on the number, the breadth and depth of programming that we can provide. Deanna Subanak johnson CBC News, Toronto. It has been an escalating problem in Ontario. The number of cars and trucks being stolen, often by very brazen and sometimes scary tactics. As Philip Lee Shannick shows us, the federal government is gearing up to host a national summit on tackling the issue. Jeep owners adore their rides, and so too, it turns out, do thieves. My previous Jeep, which I love, love, loved, was stolen the first week I bought it. Her insurance company said she'd have to pay a surcharge for the next one or outfit it with a GPS tracker. Really, the manufacturer should be putting them in then. It's all a reaction to a spike in the number of vehicle thefts. According to the Insurance Bureau of Canada, in 2022, claims paid out exceeded $1 billion for the first time. Police say 2023 Toyota Highlanders like this one are a target, so this owner has locked it down. He has a disc lock on the steering wheel. You have to punch a code in to start the engine. It has an OBD blocker to stop thieves from reprogramming the ignition. And it has a GPS tracking device installed at the request of the insurance company. Those companies say manufacturers need to update anti-theft measures. And some people are hoping the government will force action when it hosts a national summit on auto theft next week. Really, it's uh, building a vehicle and designing a vehicle 
uh, with the technology and the effectiveness uh, to prevent theft is really the key. New regulations out last summer do require manufacturers to install anti-theft devices, but the standards haven't been adopted yet, and manufacturers don't see them as necessary. It's not just an auto theft issue. We would say it's an organized crime issue. Um, the organized criminal, criminals are uh, both technically savvy and very well financed. CBC News asked Transport Canada if it will be adopting the new anti-theft standards. We haven't heard back. When engine immobilizer devices were made mandatory in all new vehicles in 2007, there was an immediate effect. Auto thefts dropped by half. Philip Lishanok, CBC News, Toronto. The Toronto Tea Festival was back this weekend celebrating its 10th year bringing to together enthusiasts, industry experts and vendors. This year we have 49 vendors, um, 51 booths, a couple took out a couple extras, you know. Um, so 49 vendors and uh, we've had over 4,000 attendees over the weekend, um, 1,700 today on a Sunday coming out, which is great. Um, we're really excited. It's our biggest we've had yet. The event was held at the Toronto Reference Library. A wide variety of tea-related products and accessories were showcased, including, of course, the star attraction, tea. And you're looking at some drone footage of Ottawa's Rideau Canal, where above seasonal temperatures means the skateway is closed after just opening last weekend. Officials say it is just not safe. It will reopen as soon as weather permits. So yes, it needs to be cold. So here's a question. Do you like cold and sunny or kind of warmish but gloomy and gray? Well, whatever you like, you're going to have a little bit of everything this <laughs> upcoming go. work week. And we've had a real mixed bag, and it certainly continues. The backyard rinks and the Rideau are certainly showing the proof of that pudding. Uh, look at this upcoming week ahead. Not cold enough in the Ottawa region, even with those overnight lows, to sustain that 30 centimeters of ice thickness that we need. But there is hope at the end of the Long Range Tunnel. We'll talk about next weekend in a minute. Right now, though, just a fraction of ice coverage on the Great Lakes. We're losing it as well. It's been uh, a warm week, and we're also talking about this big ridge of high pressure that we mentioned earlier that will be forming, bringing astronomical warmth all the way up to James Bay, Hudson's Bay. Look at this, Moosinee Wednesday, plus two. That's about 15 to 18 degrees above their seasonal normal. But will this warmth bring about more sun than what we've had for the past week? Not really. It's still a dreary week ahead until you get into next weekend when that cool, clear high pressure comes in. A rainy day on Thursday washes away that mid week warmth and brings back a little bit of an arctic chill and there's a bit more hope at the end of this tunnel for anybody that's a winter sports enthusiast uh february 2nd groundhog day that furry prognosticator could bring about <laughs> maybe some more hope of a few more weeks of cold winter weather if that's your thing you know what i think <laughs> we can do with some cold temperatures if we just get some sunshine lifts the yes. spirits yes next weekend will be sunny and cool and clear Okay, we'll take it. Thanks so much, Sophia. We hope you have a great Welcome. week ahead. And thank you for watching our show. It's been nice having you with us. Hope you have a great night. We'll see you next week.